Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor back. Today's podcast is a bit special because today's podcast, not a bit, a bit I'm underselling it. Today's podcast, we had to bring this guest back because we got so much feedback about her electricity and her just awesome sassiness combined with science that folks were just like, Jonathan, you have got to bring Dr. Sarah Gottfried back on the show. So you know what I did? I said, Sarah, will you come back on the show? And Sarah said, maybe. No, I'm just kidding. She said, yes. Sarah, <laughs> welcome to the show. How you doing? So good. Electricity, sassiness. Oh my gosh. I've got a lot to live up to today. Let's, let's do this. Well, you have all sorts of adjectives that I love. For example, on, on your website, sarahgodfriedmd.com, you say sexy, ripe, and delicious which are three uh, adjectives that I'm not sure I've ever heard combined together in that way. Can you tell us a bit about how a, a, a Harvard-trained physician, wife, mother, scholar, yoga teacher helps people to become sexy, ripe, and delicious? Absolutely. You know, I, I think we want the whole package. You know, some of us sort of focus on one goal at a time. Maybe it's to lose 15 pounds or it's to feel more energy in the morning, but I, I really want the whole package for the people that I work with. It's very important to me. And so feeling sexy, ripe, and delicious, that's something that I want. That's one of my aspirational goals. And I, I think that when you're clear on your desire, when you're clear on how you want to feel in your body, that changes everything. It provides a roadmap. It allows you to, you know, not roll your eyes or have your eyes glaze over as you think about the latest diet, but it, it just sets up your aspiration in a different way, which I think you articulate so beautifully, Jonathan, when it comes to the smarter, saner way to feel ease in your body. Well, I appreciate that, Sarah. And I think what you just said, you, you captured it well, and it reminded me of one of my favorite authors of all time, and that was Stephen Covey, when he talks about living a principle-centered life. And he, he's referring to more just living with honesty and integrity and not necessarily thinking about nutrition and exercise. But I actually think what you're talking about and what I'm talking about and what you describe in your new book, The Hormone Cure, is really this more of a principle science-centered approach to health and well-being rather than a tip or technique or top 10 list approach to wellness. What do you think? I love that. I love it. I mean, you know that I do the happy dance anytime you start talking about the science. So I, I think that's fantastic to kind of bring the science together with the desire, the desire for how you really want to feel in your body. You know, when you wake up in the morning and you put your feet on the floor, how do you want to feel? Like, I don't want your first thought to be, where's the coffee? That's, that's, <laughs> that is not a principle driven life or, you know, a science driven life. So I, I really appreciate how you've changed the conversation when it comes to the science of staying slim. And um, unfortunately, we just have a long, long, shameful history when it comes to diet books, the latest fad diet. And I love that you're bringing the science to the table. And yes, 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 on that principle science-centered life. Well, thank you, Sarah. And the thing that encourages me so much, and, and you talk about this, uh, obviously, in your work, and you talk about just on your website, like things you enjoy. And what you enjoy is, is very much based in the science. And the science is quite clear. You enjoy plenty of food, what I call eating more but smarter, and exercising less to maintain your 25-plus pound weight loss for many, many years. So, Sarah, we have millions of people who are eating more and exercising less, albeit doing it smarter, getting better results. We have tens of thousands of pages of scientific research showing that it's not about starvation and stair steppers. Why are we still told it is? Hmm. Well, I think it's, I think it's many things. And, um, my way into the why, you know, why do we keep pushing the rock up the hill instead of letting it just, you know, sort of work with gravity? Why aren't we working with the innate intelligence of the body and instead starving it and turning on the thrifty genes, which we know are not good. You know, those thrifty genes that I happen to have in large supply, what I'm talking about here is those genes that tend to make you insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. 
the ones that make you not fit into your skinny jeans. And I'm talking here about J E A N S. So <laughs> the, you know, I, I think that, um, my family is from Ireland and also from Poland. And so we're really good at surviving famine. So there's an evolutionary benefit to the genetics that I have, which tend to make me, um, a little more on the chunky side, shall we say. And so maintaining this 25 pound weight loss has been all about, stepping into the grace and the clarity of science. And I love that you and I are on parallel tracks with that. And I want to hear a little bit more about kind of how you bring that to the table. But one of the things I learned, you know, when I was sitting in my doctor's office 10 years ago, and I had my muffin top spilling over my jeans, and he told me I needed to exercise more and eat less. And that just was a defining moment for me, Jonathan, because it felt wrong. It felt wrong. You know, there were other things he was offering, including a birth control pill and an antidepressant. I won't even go into those right now, but the, the eat less, exercise more, you know, he, he just looked down his nose at me and said, you're a doctor. It's simple math. Exercise more, eat less. And he was totally wrong. So not only did I feel bad and like, I just like, couldn't get it together to master this simple math. I also had an inkling that my problem was hormonal mm -hmm. and indeed it was. So I started to do some biohacking. I realized that my cortisol was sky high. I was leptin resistant. I was insulin resistant and I, I needed to turn those things around and I did it by eating more food and exercising less. So hooray for that. Well, Sarah, I can certainly empathize with your, I love that you told the story of, of someone saying to you, you know, you're, you're a physician. Why can't you just exercise more self-control and eat less and exercise more? And I was recently speaking with my lovely wife and I, I told her, I was like, you know, this whole eat less, exercise more thing. Cause I was, I was speaking with, with someone about psychological disorders and, and we, we came across the analogy of imagine walking into a psychiatrist's office with, with diagnosed and brain scannably verifiable uh, manic depression or, or any sort of depression. And the psychiatrist saying, you weak person, just s frown less and smile more. Mm. And your depression will go away. And now certainly there is some, like if we do smile more and frown less, like that does have some effect, but it's, it's ignoring this much deeper and, and studyable physiological change that has happened within the body and within the brain. And interestingly enough, the deeper and deeper we dig into neurobiology and endocrinology, we can see, just as you've said, that when we see obesity and we see type 2 diabetes, we see the same kind of altered uh, uh, gut microbiota, hypothalamic inflammation, hormonal disruption. There's a lot of stuff going on that eating less and exercising more does nothing about, right? Yeah, I mean, you just articulated it so beautifully, and I, I love that you're bringing in a fresh new analogy of, you know, this this person who's suffering with manic depression seeing a psychiatrist and the ridiculousness of saying, uh, buck up, frown less. You know, it just doesn't work. It's not a matter of willpower. And even though I, I really believe that there's a lot to be said about mindset, we sort of kicked off by talking about Stephen Covey and mindset and desire. I also think that we've got to look at the biology. You know, maybe, maybe it's, it's again a parallel track where you are working on the biology and you're asking the question, you know, maybe it's my hormones. What's going on with my hormones? What's happening with the top hormones and metabolism and you're asking that alongside with the mindset, the emotions, the psychology, and not just assuming that you've got some sort of moral failing and it's a lack of willpower that's led to the extra 10 or 20 pounds that you're carrying around. So I, I really appreciate that. And I, I love how you just described the, the neurobiology that it's, it's, you know, eating less, exercising more is not going to help you when you're control system, your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is wonky. It's not going to help you when you're leptin resistant and all you can think about is food, 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 because you just don't reach that place of satiety. 
that happens when you've got leptin imbalance. So I, I really appreciate what you're bringing to the table. I feel like along with that, I want to give our listeners some practical tips and maybe not be so abstract. Should Absolutely. Yes. Dial this in a little. Dial, dial away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want you to dial with me. So, um, you know, you and I were talking last time about Barry Sears, and I, I feel like, you know, maybe we should invite him into the conversation because he did such so much early work. You know, you, you're you like me in that um, I think you probably devour about 20 studies before breakfast, <laughs> and um, I, I do the same. But Barry Sears, you know, a lot of his work on insulin resistance goes back to the 90s, mm. even the 80s. We have been dancing with this hormone for a very long time. And, you know, insulin resistance, I think of it very simply as just your cells become numb to insulin. Mm -hmm. Like insulin's knocking on the door and nobody's answering the damn door. So we've got to figure out how to make your cells sensitive to insulin again so that they hear the knock on the door and insulin doesn't just keep climbing and making you pile on fat because it's a fat storage hormone. And Barry Sears did all this interesting work showing that you can turn around insulin resistance in 48 to 72 hours. I think that's such an incredible opportunity. And it's also something that we see with these other hormones. So many of these other hormones, such as cortisol, which belongs to the glucocorticoid family, you know, we know that there's hormone resistance with most of these hormones of metabolism. We know there's a problem called glucocorticoid resistance, which is where you become numb to the stress hormones like cortisol just as there is progesterone resistance, which is the mechanism behind PMS, just as there is insulin resistance, which most people have heard of, and leptin resistance. So I, I think it might be helpful just to talk about some of the strategies that help to reset these hormones and improve. Here's how I like to think about it, going back to the sexy, ripe, and delicious. <laughs> what we want to do is we want to improve the molecular sex that's happening between these hormones of metabolism and their receptor. How do you like that, Jonathan? You like that analogy? <laughs> I do, and I want you to continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so Barry Sears looked at the zone diet as a way of resetting insulin resistance. And I think we've learned a lot since then. Um, I don't follow a zone diet. You know, what I follow is a little bit more nuanced than that. But I, I want to hear from you, Jonathan. Can you say a little bit about maybe what you had for breakfast today since we talked about the 20 studies that you read before breakfast? <laughs> so how how zony was your breakfast? What did you eat to improve the molecular sex that was happening between insulin and the insulin receptor today at your table? Well, well first of all, I want to say that I love that you mentioned Barry Sears because I actually had the good fortune of recording a show with him yesterday. So I'm very excited to share that with our listeners. Obviously, Oh, my gosh. Uh, Barry really, Sears in the house. In the house. No, Barry Barry is a, a really great guy and had some really good things to say. So that's awesome. I'm glad we can give him some props here as well. And and yet, Sarah, the thing that I that always makes me smile, and you and you know I, I talk about this a lot, is <clears throat> the the problem, the biology is so complicated. And in fact, the the society we live in and the emotional contexts, that's so complicated. But the common denominator to reverse nearly all of this stuff is so simple in my estimation and in the research I've read, and that's eat things you can find in nature that are as dense in nutrients as possible. And don't drink anything that a human has been involved in. <laughs> Basically, so if, if a human's touched it, with the exception of purified water, of course, you might want to be a little bit cautious, unless, of course, you know, we're talking coffee, tea, natural things. But the challenge, I think, Sarah, is in cutting through. I mean, that that's really it. And I think trying to take it any deeper than that, that's what sometimes people get a little fired up because it's like, well, I eat these types of whole foods. And the other people are like, well, I eat these types of nutrient-dense whole foods. And you know what? At the end of the day, as long as you're getting great results, that's what I, that's what I care about. So the actual specific type of nutrient-dense whole foods that I eat – will undoubtedly be a bit different from you because we're obviously very, very different people. But we have that common denominator. Actually, we were separated at birth. I decided that with our first <laughs> podcast. 
Well, certainly, let's put it this way. I think our hormones are quite different. So because of that, we may okay. have uh, different whole foods that are optimal for us. Is that fair? I'll give you that. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, so like what I had for, for breakfast, I, I actually – so let's be very clear. I, I'm also very lazy <laughs> when it comes to food preparation. Good. So okay. What, this is going to be good. What Jonathan Baylor eats is more uh, determined by what I can prepare in bulk on the weekend and then eat consistently throughout the week. So again, this this will also uncover a bit of how boring and OCD I am because I eat basically the same thing every day. So what I had for breakfast is uh, actually this wonderful – sane coffee cake type biscuit thing that I make, which is a combination of eggs and egg whites, as well as coconut, completely unsweetened coconut meat, uh, cinnamon, as well as some vanilla, some guar gum as a binder. And uh, that's actually it. Maybe some stevia, maybe a little bit of xylitol, but not, not a lot. And I bake that up, and it turns into this wonderful nutrient-dense treat. And I always wash that down with a green shake, which is kale, romaine le lettuce, and spinach, just blent up in my Vitamix with some cinnamon, and I'm good to go. I love it. I knew the kale was going to come in at some point. I was waiting, <laughs> I was waiting for the kale, and... Uh, you never disappoint. So I'm coming over for breakfast tomorrow. That sounds super yummy. <laughs> well, the thing and... that I, I love about it too, Sarah, is I actually, the reason I do that is because I can just eat it at my desk, right? Like I, I'm just drinking my shake. I'm eating my little thing. I don't, I think sometimes people think that this is some weird time consuming. Well, weird, maybe what I just described is actually quite weird, but time consuming. No, it was actually not time consuming at all. So <laughs> I love it. And I love that you make it so simple, you know, that you kind of do the bulk on the weekend and just make this ridiculously easy on a work day because people need that. You know, I think a big part of that struggle that you were asking about, you know, why is it that it's pretty clear what we need to eat? It's really clear what the science is telling us. And yet we're still struggling so much. And diet books are still, you know, the top bestsellers on the New York Times bestseller list. So I, I really appreciate how how you got more granular with your breakfast with all the caveats that you offered. And I just want to point out a couple of things, if I may. Absolutely. So first of all, I just wanted to say, love the cinnamon. You had kind of a cinnamon theme song going through your uh, breakfast. And we know that cinnamon is one of the best insulin sensitizers that we have. In fact, there's robust data showing that the number one hormone imbalance that women face which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, kind of a misnamed term that really is insulin resistance in disguise for women. We know that cinnamon is one of the most effective ways to reverse polycystic ovarian syndrome, and you can do it just with a half a teaspoon a day. So how cool is that? And you also, you know, I love kale. I told you the story of my great grandmother when we talked last time and how she would show up with kale. She didn't think of kale as a vegetable. She thought of it as a lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree with that. Like kale, quinoa, it's, it's, uh, it's so good for you in terms of the way that it interacts with your DNA. Food is information as we talked about last time. And I also, I love that, um, that you have a green drink and you have sort of that reset each morning where you are, reversing some of that acidifying ash that we have in our food. And I, you and I haven't talked about kind of acid base balance before. Should we bring in a little bit on that? I'm curious sort of what you've seen in terms of the scientific literature on acid base balance. Clearly you like to alkalize. I do. And in fact, I forgot to mention that preceding what I just mentioned, like right, right when I wake up, I'm, I'm, I'm not at all hungry. In fact, eating is, is not pleasant for that first half hour. So right when I wake up and this will, this will make you happy. Hopefully I have a, a super alkaline boost in the sense that I take three lemons and I throw them in my Vitamix, of course, peeled as well as some green tea, as well as some cinnamon. And I blend that up. And I just drink that because it's quite delicious and I like to get my hydration up first thing in the morning. And as you know, that green tea and that lemon also consumed simultaneously does not only wonders from a polyphenol blah, blah, blah perspective, but when you want to talk about alkalizing, hopefully that maybe, maybe, maybe 
instill the happy dance in you? <laughs> oh, yes, totally the happy dance. And there's that cinnamon again. I, I'm totally with you on that. I think it's it's so important to hit that reset button every morning. If you combine that with five deep belly breaths as a way of de-acidifying, I think you, you know, you really have me dancing. You have me like singing a rap song at that point. <laughs> <laughs> And my, my great grandmother did that too. You know, one of the points you made earlier is that, yeah, there's so much science, there's so much complexity to the emotional and psychological issues around food. There's so much complexity to the science and you have to, you know, basically quit your day job to sort of take on the science. And yet the solution is so simple, you know, and you described it so beautifully. And Michael Pollan has as well, where he talks about how, you want to eat foods that your your great grandparents would recognize. And my great grandmother didn't have a Vitamix, but she had <laughs> hot water with lemon every single morning. Mm -hmm. It was really important to her to kind of wake up with that. And it also stimulates the gastrocolic reflex so that you poop. I'm a gynecologist, so I feel like I can say poop on your show. <laughs> and and she also had this before she went to bed. She would have a cup of hot water with lemon. And lo and behold, there's some research showing that it lowers your cortisol level. When you have, when you drink a full eight ounce glass of water before you go to bed, a lot of people don't do that because they feel like it's going to make them pee all night long. And it turns out that it's really important for managing these hormones and metabolism, such as cortisol. And the cool thing, Sarah, the thing that makes me the happiest about all of this is that once you see the light for lack of better terms and your work embodies this very very well it, it is a sexy ripe and delicious life because sarah like you i'm eating good food i'm enjoying my food i am never eating these little like snack pack are you kidding me i am eat when i eat i don't play around and i'm leaving the table satisfied and I feel satisfied and I feel good about myself. And I think there are other areas of life where sometimes we can feel quote unquote satisfied temporarily and not feel good about ourselves. And, and we don't like it in that area of life. Let's not do that to ourselves when it comes to eating either. Let's feel satisfied and good about ourselves afterwards. What do you think? Well, I love that. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this is, this is such an important concept related to the innate intelligence of the body and how it sometimes it's not so much that you've got to figure out how to be smarter in your body. Sometimes you just have to remove some of the obstacles. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. You know, having those little snack packs, that is not amplifying the innate intelligence of the body. Like it's just, it's not, it's not information for your DNA that you want it's a much better choice to have what you were just describing, you know, the three lemons with the green tea and the cinnamon in your Vitamix. I, I just, I love that. Like that is the best information you can give to your body, to your brain in the morning. I mean, I also love that it's, it's improving the dopamine signaling in your brain. Can we have a little science moment here? Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> just in case people were feeling, you know, so underserved when it comes to science. What I love about green tea, as long as you're using it medicinally and you're not, you know, like uh, pounding gallons a day, what I love about green tea is that it raises dopamine. And if you're someone like me, I tend to be a little short on dopamine. It's one of the reasons why I'm on Facebook a lot, because I get a little dopamine hit every time I get on <laughs> Facebook. And dopamine is that lovely brain chemical responsible for pleasure, satisfaction, and focus. So in the part of my brain where I'm really very satisfied and feel good about myself, my prefrontal cortex, I need more dopamine. And so that green tea helps me with that. The alkalizing helps me with getting my enzymes to really work for me and not just sit on the sidelines, you know, having a tea party. So, um, so yes, I love that. And I, we need more of that. We need to figure out how to reinforce that feeling of satisfaction around food and also feeling good about ourselves and our choices. I feel like you and I both talk about this big vision, this big vision of, of what we want for people in terms of food and health, 
But it's really these tiny, small baby steps, these small little decisions that we make each day that add up to the big vision over time. So I appreciate that. What do you think of that, Jonathan? I absolutely agree with you, uh, Sarah. There are there are these small steps that we can take to heal our relationship with food and with our body, and and some of them are are more mentally challenging than others. But from an actual tactical perspective, they they are easy. Uh, a canonical example I give is, and I if if an individual can't do this. I, I struggle to see how they will achieve long-term nutritional serenity and wellness because I actually think it matters a lot. And I'm curious to see what you think, Sarah, and that is getting rid of your scale. Literally, I want people to physically break their scale because I think it's going to do a couple things. One, it's going to make you stop worrying about that number, which is irrelevant on all levels by a measuring tape instead, or buy some jeans you want to wear instead. It's more indicative of both aesthetic beauty as well as wellness, as well as disease prevention, yada, yada, yada. But it also allows you to have a little bit of a ceremony because as you destroy that piece of garbage, which is what it is, you can also feel a sense of destroying those, those old paradigms that have forced you into a life of shrinking down and starving yourself because it's really about building yourself up as you talk about, Sarah. And that scale, like if we cannot get rid of that scale, I feel like we're not giving ourselves permission to actually embrace this lifestyle of eating and exercising smarter rather than just starving ourselves. What do you think? (laughs) Well, Jonathan, I feel like I can always count on you to be bold and to be right out there in front saying something so important. And I I love this. So I'm going to I'm going to unpack this maybe in a few layers if that's cool with you. Please layer it up. So when you first started talking along this line, you know, get rid of your scale, all of my girly resistances came up, right? So I had my okay, that's fine for you as a guy, but what about us chicks? Like we rely on that scale to kind of keep us honest. But you then went on and sort of talked about this ceremony and you said, you know, let's have a little ceremony around throwing away this piece of garbage. And that that got me to buy in a little bit more. And then I started thinking, wait a minute, what's really important here is not the number on the scale. What's important is, as you were describing, the tape measure, you know, knowing your waist size, knowing your body fat measurement. You know, I'm a big fan of tracking lean body mass and ideally growing that or at least maintaining it over time because it's one of the best indicators of longevity. And then even better, I love testing my blood sugar. So Mm -hmm. I do that once a week just a way to keep me honest about fasting blood sugar because we know the optimal range is has changed over time. And we know that fasting blood sugar should really be between 70 and 86. When you're above 86, that's a sign that you have insulin resistance, going back to the whole Barry Sears conversation. And so I have these other ways of keeping me honest and tracking and being a biohacker because we know that what you measure improves. So long story short, I don't want to have a little ceremony around throwing away my scale. I want to have a gigantic ceremony. Like I want to have a big frat party. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, Sarah, I, I completely support you. I, I see it as, and this, this has been borne out in much psychological practice that having these, these physical manifestations, the, the releasing the balloon into the air or the cutting of the ribbon or the doing something physical to represent a mental and emotional emotional shift is so powerful. And this is also functional because unless you break the thing, you're going to be tempted to, to get it back out. So, <laughs> so absolutely. Let, maybe we should start. People used to have Tupperware parties. Maybe we should have scale destruction parties. <laughs> oh, Jonathan, you're totally onto something. I think this is a new YouTube video that you and I need to shoot and it's got total virality. This is going to start a revolution. I'm super excited about it. And and by the way, at the frat party, we're going to be serving green juice. <laughs> I love it. One, it reminds me, Sarah, of the scene from the movie Office Space, where they destroy the copy machine. I think I think that'll that'll even further if we can if we can work that in, that'll even further further the virality of of this movement. 
Love it. Love Sarah, it. Well, well, I know you have some awesome familial obligations you need to attend to, so I super appreciate you sharing your time and insight with us. It's, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to be in conversation with you, Jonathan. So fun. So fun. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah. And folks, obviously, we've only scratched the surface here with Sarah. We've had her on the show twice. Hopefully, we'll have her on for a third time. But if you need to get more, which you do need to get more, there's plenty of places to do that. First, you can go to Sarah Godfried, MD. Dot com. Learn more about the woman behind the brand new book, The Hormone Cure Book.com. The book is called The Hormone Cure, but the website is The Hormone Cure Book.com. New York Times bestseller, scientifically backed, all about smarter eating and exercise. I'm a big fan, and I'm a big fan of the author. Sarah, thanks again. My pleasure, Jonathan. Thanks, everybody. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's show as much as I did. And please remember this week and every week after eat smarter, exercise smarter and live better. Talk with you soon.